So guys, this is the continuation of chapter 21. This is page 165, but at the end, okay? Uh, let's dive. The Laxes aren't the only ones who heard from a young age that Hopkins and other hospitals abducted black people. Since at least the 1800s, black oral history has been filled with tales of night doctors who kidnapped black people for research. And there were disturbing truths behind those stories. Some of the stories were conjured by white plantation owners taking advantage of the long-held African belief that ghosts caused de disease and death. To discourage slaves from meeting or escaping, slave owners told tales of gruesome research done on black bodies, then covered themselves in white sheets and crept around at night, posing as spirits coming to infect black people with disease or steal them from research. Those sheets eventually gave rise to the white hooded cloaks of the Ku Klux Klan. The night doctors weren't just fictions conjured as scare tactics. tactics. Many doctors tested drugs on slaves and operated on them to develop new surgical techniques, often use, without using anesthesia. Fear of night doctors only increased in the early 1900s, as black people migrated north to Washington, D.C. and Baltimore and news spread that medical schools were offering money in exchange for bodies. Black corpses were routinely exhumed from graves for research, and an underground shipping industry kept schools in the north supplied with black bodies from the south for anatomy courses. The bodies sometimes arrived, a dozen or so at a time, in barrels labeled turpentine. Because of this history, black residents near Hopkins have long believed the hospital was built in a poor black neighborhood for the benefit of scientists, to give them easy access to potential research subjects. In fact, it was built for the benefit of the Baltimore's poor. Jim Hopkins was born on a tobacco plantation in Maryland, where his father later fed his slaves nearly 60 years before emancipation. Hopkins made millions working as a banker and grocer and selling his own brand of whiskey, but he never married and had no children. So in 1873, no long before his death, he donated seven million to start a medical school and charity hospital. He wrote a letter to the 12 men he had chosen to serve at his board of trustees, outlining his wishes. In it, he explained that the purpose of Hopkins Hospital was to help those who otherwise couldn't get medical care. The indigent sick of the city and its environs environs, without regard to sex, age, or color, who require surgical or medical treatment, and who can be received into the hospital without peril to other inmates, and the poor of the city and state of all races who are stricken down by any casualty shall be received into the hospital without charge. He specified that the only patients to be charged were those who could easily afford it, and that any money they brought in should then be spent treating those without money. He also set aside an additional two million worth of property and 20,000 in cash each year, specifically for helping black children. It'll be your duty hereafter to provide suitable biddle buildings for the reception, maintenance and education of orphaned colored children. I dis direct you to provide accommodations for three or four hundred children of this class. You are also authorized to receive into the asylum at your discretion, as belonging to such class, colored children who have lost one parent only, and in exceptional cases, to receive children who are not orphans, but may be in such circumstances as to require the aid of charity. Hopkins died not long after writing that letter. His boards of trustees, many of them friends and family, created one of the top medical schools in the country and a hospital whose public wards provided millions of dollars in free care to the poor and many of them black. But the history of Hopkins Hospital certainly isn't pristine when it comes to black patients. In 1969, a Hopkins research used blood samples from more than 7,000 neighborhood children, most of them from poor black families 
to look for a genetic predisposition to criminal behavior. The researcher didn't get consent. The American Civil, Civil Liberties Union filed suit claiming the study violated the boys' civil rights and breached confidentiality of doctor-patient relationships by releasing results to state and juvenile courts. The study was halted, then resumed a few months later with using consent forms. And in the late 90s, two women sued Hopkins claiming that its researchers had knowingly exposed their children to lead and hadn't promptly informed them one blood test revealed that their children had elevated lead levels, even when one developed lead poisoning. The research was part of a study examining lead abatement methods, and all families involved were black. The researchers had treated several homes to varying degrees, then encouraged landlords to rent those homes to families with children so they could then monitor the children's lead levels. Initially, the case was dismissed. On appeal, one judge compared the study to Southam's HeLa injections, the Tuskegee study, and Nazi research, and the case eventually settled out of court. The Department of Health and Human Services launched an investigation and concluded that the study's consent forms failed to provide an adequate description of the different levels of lead abatement in the homes. But today, when people talk about the history of Hopkins' relationship with the black community, the story many of them to hold up as the worst offense is that of Henrietta Lacks, a black woman whose body, they say, was exploited by white scientists. Sitting in Lawrence's living room, Sonny and Babette yelled back and forth for nearly an hour about Hopkins and snatching black people. Eventually, Sonny leaned back in his chair and said, John Hopkins didn't give us no information about anything. That was the bad part. Not the sad part, but the bad part, because I don't know if they didn't give us information because they was making money out of it. Or, if they was just wanted to keep us in the dark about it, I think they made money out of it. Because they were selling herself all over the world and shipping them for dollars. Hopkins say they gave themselves away, Lawrence yelled. But they made millions. It's not fair. She's the most important person in the world and her family living in poverty. If our mother is so important to science, why can't we get health insurance? Dad had, day had prostate cancer and asbestos-filled lungs. Sonny had a bad heart, and Deborah had arthritis, osteoporosis, nerve deafness, anxiety, and depression. With all that, plus the whole family's high blood pressure and diabetes, the Lackesses figured they pretty much supported the pharmaceutical industry, plus several doctors. But their insurance came and went. Some were covered through Medicare, others on and off by spouses, but they all went stretches with no coverage or money for treatment. As Lacus's men talked about Hopkins and insurance, Babette snorted in disgust and walked to her recliner in the living room. My pressure going up, and I'm not gonna die over this, you know? The whole thing just wasn't worth the whole thing just wasn't worth getting riled up over, she said. But she couldn't help herself. Everybody knew black people were disappearing because Hopkins was experimenting on them, she yelled. I believe a lot of it is true, was true. Probably so, Sonny said. A lot of mine have been a myth too. You never know. But one thing we do know, them cells about my mother ain't no myth. They chumped his cane again thumped his cane again. You know what is a myth? Bobette snapped from the recliner. Everybody always saying Henrietta Lacks donated those cells. She didn't donate nothing. They took them and didn't ask. She inhaled a deep breath to calm herself. Oh, she inhaled a deep breath to calm herself. What really would upset Henrietta is the fact that Dr. Guy never told the family anything. We didn't know nothing about those cells, and he didn't care. That just rubbed us the wrong way. I just kept asking everybody, 
Why didn't they say anything to the family? They knew how to contact us. If Dr. Guy wasn't dead, I think I would have killed him myself. And this is the end of chapter 21.